Welcome to The Conversation. I am Carrie Ann, and I will be your host in this first segment of the show. Uh, today, I am joined by Benjamin, once again, our most dominant personality on the show. I'm also joined by Mike, our rocket specialist, and I, of course, have a data behind us who's going to be producing the show. Now, today in news... Get ready for low latency, high quality, reasonably priced, gigabit inter satellite internet. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a thing. Oh, no, it's real. It's <laughs> okay, coming. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> and Virgin Orbit is gearing up for the first flight of their Launcher 1 rocket. That will be very, very cool. And then Benjamin's going to be having an interview with one Paul Hildebrandt, formerly known as Fight for Space. And now going to be, he's going to be talking about our first to the moon Kickstarter project that's coming up. That will be very, very cool. And then in our third segment, we're, of course, going to get back to our questions and comments, concerns, complaints about last week's show. This is Tomorrow Orbit 11.03. Good morning. How's everything up in the sky? Hello! So I want to make sure that I give a huge thank you to all of our huge supporters, all of the Escape Velocity citizens. Uh, there are so many of you. And you'll notice at the very top it says patreon.com slash tomorrow. And now it also says makersupport.com. Uh, that is something uh, we're going to get into a little bit here. Uh, but these people have given us $10 or more per episode on Patreon or $30 per month or more on Maker Support. They get their, of course, their name in the show in all three segments, the early access to lots of different things, free worldwide shipping in our swag store, so, so very much more. If you are interested in participating and becoming a citizen of tomorrow, feel free to hit up either Patreon or Makersupport.com and uh, and and do all of that. Benjamin, yeah. Maker Support, that's a new thing you had me say. That is a new thing I had you say. So, uh, I'm what's, sorry. That's okay. So, uh, yeah, so, you know, as of Orbit 11, we broke it into two different uh, systems, uh, Patreon.com, and that is for if you want to uh, contribute to the shows on a per-episode basis. Uh, it's exactly as it was before. No changes to Patreon.com whatsoever. So if you're already a Patreon.com subscriber, awesome. No changes for you. Uh, although I do recommend making sure you have a monthly cap set because as we add more shows, you know those numbers are going to the number of shows are going to go up. So make sure you, make sure you're comfortable with the amount that you're contributing to the show. But we also have uh, we moved to Minds.com mm -hmm. starting with Orbit 11. Uh, we did a few shows using Minds.com, and the back-end technology necessary for us to get your names in the shows and give you rewards is very lacking. Uh, it just it's does not exist. And for yeah. anyone curious, right. I can I, maybe I'll do like a, a hangout talking about how awful that was. So uh, we're, we're instead uh, we're just going to rip the bandaid off and go. Nope, nope, no mines. We're moving over to MakerSupport.com. So if you want to contribute on a monthly basis, mm -hmm. you, you don't want you don't care how many shows. Just once a month. Just here's here's your contribution to the show. Same reward levels as the Patreon stuff. Mm -hmm. Just different different tiers because it's monthly instead, or different right. amounts because it's monthly. That's at makersupport.com slash tomorrow. We are going to phase out. So anyone who contributed on minds.com, mm -hmm. for the remainder of your contribution, you'll remain in the show. But once that's done, mm -hmm. uh, that's completely phased out. We are not accepting any more minds.com. That's it. Like So once those are done, those are done. Please move your pledges over to makersupport.com slash tmro. So that's what's going on. I'm sorry, everyone, for like, the quick uh, switcheroo, mm -hmm. but I figured we should do this early rather than dragging it on and trying to fix things and then not having right. to fix and have to do it. Right. So that's what's going on there. All right. All very, right. Very cool. Should we head it over to Space Mike? Uh, yes, you've talked enough. So Space Mike, <laughs> uh, the other thing they like to do at the top of the show is go over any launches that may have happened since last week's show. And uh, I, there's a lot. Your name just keeps popping up, man. Like, you have at least four of these. Uh, so I will go ahead and let you take it away. All right, well, uh, the first one that happened, we actually talked about this last week. There was a launch that happened prior to last week's show, but there hadn't been any uh, media uploaded of that. And in fact, there still hasn't really been any media uploaded, <laughs> except for a handful of pictures. So uh, do the best we can. But what I'm talking about is a Long March 2D rocket, which launched last Saturday, uh, January 13th, at 7.10 Coordinated Universal Time from the Jiquan Satellite Space Center in uh, northwestern China, uh, in the uh, Inner Mongolia region. 
Now, um, I, there is a video of the, the first launch of a similar satellite. The payload was the third in a new series of Chinese high-resolution res mapping satellites called LKW-3, and what you're seeing is the launch of LKW-1. It was placed into an orbit around 310 miles up, or around 500 kilometers in altitude, and inclined 97.3 degrees to the equator. Now, Chinese officials have released pretty much no details about the mysterious missions, and each one was launched on a Long March 2D rocket. And the orbital data for these satellites were published by the U.S. military's catalog of human-made objects in space. Now, uh, these satellites are described as land resource exploration satellites, and there was no real additional explanation for their missions. Uh, China launched the two earlier land resource satellites on December 3rd and December 23rd into near identical orbits, and as the same one that launched on Saturday, LKW-3. Now, they're presumably part of a new Chinese military re reconnaissance fleet carrying high-resolution imaging instruments, but that's all we really know. So uh, this isn't pick of the actual launch of the LK-3, uh, since we couldn't find any video of the launch itself. So a little disappointing that there wasn't too much footage there, but at least it was a successful launch. And there's quite a few more that we have to get going to. So the next one that I wanted to talk about was a uh, pretty cool launch. Uh, JAXA launched for the third time their Epsilon rocket. Hmm. And uh, this was really cool. This was a lot uh, that launched on Wednesday, January 17th at 2106 Coordinated Universal Time from the Ushinora Space Center. And it was launching the Asnaro 2 radar imaging satellite. Now, the payload Asnaro 2 was developed by NEC Corp. Remember NEC computers? Oh, man. And uh, the satellite, it's going to be a civilian operated radar imaging satellite that's designed to collect all weather imagery for use in emergencies, mapping, and global surveillance. Using the infrared, it can even take the, these pictures through clouds and nighttime that usually block orbital cameras. Now, the rocket itself uh, is designed based off of the solid rocket boosters on the, the much bigger H2A rocket. And the second stage of this uh, a four-stage rocket was first flown on the M5 rocket and has been upgraded to hold more solid fuel. The third stage also flew on the M5, but has had its nozzle redesigned to be lighter and more vacuum optimized. Now, this flight was also the first flight of an enhanced hypergolic fourth stage called the Post Boost Module, or BPM, which performs two engine burns to place the spacecraft into its final sun-synchronous orbit of about 500 kilometers in altitude. Uh, a fourth Epsilon flight is planned for later this year to lock multiple uh, Japanese satellites into orbit, but for this one, it was a complete success, and shortly after the launch, uh, JAXA officials announced that all parts of flight were successful and the Asnaro 2 spacecraft was healthy. So uh, this is very cool. Um, this is the, like I said, only the third flight of the Epsilon rocket. And uh, this kind of rounds out JAXA's fleet of rockets, especially since they have many more upgrades that are planned for the, the particular rocket. So very happy to see that. But hey, in any case, we have un... Well, before yeah, you, I was going to say, before you move on, uh, just out of my own personal curiosity, I actually hadn't heard of the Epsilon rocket before. Uh, I added into the calendar last really? week. Uh, yeah, is this a is this a newer? I, I guess I'm just not as well versed on this rocket. Is this a newer rocket? That's then? why he's the specialist. <laughs> that is why you're the specialist. <laughs> so is this an is this yeah. a newer rocket? It is. Um, I believe that their baseline version flew for the first time in actually 2013, mm. which was kind of like a, a maiden test flight. But a, some of our viewers might remember that the first version of the enhanced. Epsilon rocket was actually back in 2016, and uh, I remember a lot of comments about how quickly it was able to shoot off the pads, similar to the uh, Ariane 5 and other solid rockets. Um, but yeah, this is this is a new rocket. As I said, this was just the third flight ever of it, and uh, um, I'm excited to see what else they have planned for it in the future. It's a little weird that the the timing between each launch is so is so many years apart, but maybe that's why I just didn't remember it. But yeah, I hit it hit it in the calendar. I'm like, I don't know that rocket at all. I don't remember this at all. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it not only does it jump off the pad, it like pitch kicks immediately. It's weird looking, right? Because it doesn't just go, usually you go up off the pad, and then that pitch kick is that maneuver where you kind of go, because you're not going up, right? Orbits are essentially around, so you kind of kick around. 
it just, it's like, it looks like it's still on the pad while it's pitch kicking, right? It's like it points its engines mm -hmm. at the pad. It's like, ah, there we go. So anyhow, I thought it interesting. Yeah, I'm sorry. Immediate. Didn't mean to derail your launches. Oh, no, but yeah. you did. I did. Not at all. A little bit, a little mm -hmm. bit. <laughs> Well, the next launch that we need to talk about is another Chinese launch. And this launch was actually kind of similar to the Epsilon rocket because they launched a Long March 11 rocket, which is also a four-stage rocket, which either has two or three solid rocket stages and uh, one hypergolic upper stage, or it has two hypergolic upper stages. Don't quite know because it's a little bit of a uh, uh, secret info for that type of thing. But in any case, uh, this launch of the Long March 11 rocket happened uh, yesterday on Friday, January 19th at 4.12 Coordinated U Universal Time, also from the Jiquan Sp Satellite Launch Center. And uh, there, uh, again, I'm a little bit disappointed by some of the media that we've been uh, uh, getting from China this year. Uh, here's a picture of the uh, of liftoff of the actual rocket itself. And you can see that it launches from a mobile plant floor, kind of ICBM style launching out of a tube. And uh, what little footage we did get uh, starts mid-flight. And that's pretty much most of the, what we got for this. Again, uh, yeah, that we just uh, again it's just a four-stage rocket, and um, apparently the launch was successful. The primary payloads for this were actually six satellites. The two main satellites, which you can see there being prepared, are the Jilin 1-07 and Jilin 1-08 satellites, which are joining a growing constellation of high-resolution video satellites to uh, establish a uh, high-revisit imaging architecture to offer competitive Earth observation products on the commercial market. Market. So this was not a military launch. Now, the Jilin spacecraft were joined by several other smaller spacecraft. Uh, uh, among them were uh, satellites called the QTT-1, the Zhaozheng-2, the Zhao Enlai Chinese small satellites, and there was also a Canadian small satellite, a communications satellite provided by Kepler Communications. All of these, except for the two-unit CubeSat Zhao Enlai, were six-unit We've lost the hologram. For that, and everything was all good. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. Sorry, we, we lost the, you. At, uh, we'll just keep going. We lost you. It's six unit satellite, and then we lost everything after that. But yeah, that, that was that was pretty much it. There was a, a three six units uh, cube sats, and then one two unit cube sats. And what um, information we did get is that all six of these satellites were placed into successful orbits. Awesome. And uh, this last one was today, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Finally, I mean, ULA, yeah, we've been all me, like holding our breath today. on this one. Yeah. Yep. Good. <laughs> yeah, this one has been uh, scrubbed a couple of times and uh, finally went off. We're, of course, we're talking about the United Launch Alliance uh, launch of a Atlas V rocket last night, which uh, was technically 048 coordinating universal time today, San Saturday, January 20th. And it launched from Space Launch Complex 41 at Cape Canaveral, Florida. Six, five, four, Three, two, we have ignition and liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket carrying the fourth space-based infrared system for the United States Air Force. Now, this was launching in the rare 411 configuration, which is a four meter payload fairing and only one strap on solid rocket booster, which you can see burning there, and also a single engine Centaur upper stage. Now, this was only the fifth flight ever of the 411 configuration out of 75 Atlas V launches. And the payload, as you heard, was the fourth mission of the Sibbers Geo spacecraft, or the space based infrared system geostationary spacecraft, which is designed as an early warning missile design. Detector. Now, this spacecraft joins three others that were launched in 2011, 2013, and 2017, respectively. And once it's in an operational geostationary orbit, will complete the initial deployment of the Air Force's new next generation missile warning network. There's also at least two infrared payloads that are in elliptical orbits on top secret National Reconnaissance Office spy satellites that are also providing polar coverage to augment the new Sibbers network as well. Now, this was the first 
of seven Atlas V launches that have been planned for uh, 2018. The next Atlas V launch is scheduled for March 1st from Cape Canaveral with uh, the NOAA's GOES S Weather Observatory. And apparently, all phases of flight for this mission were successful, and the uh, uh, satellite itself was put into a good geostationary transfer orbit. And over the coming weeks, we'll be using its own uh, systems, its own uh, propulsion and engines to slowly place itself into its final geostationary orbit. So congratulations to United Launch Alliance and the Air Force for the successful launch and uh, hope to see a lot more uh, of these in the future. Very, very cool. Um, I, there was, I was searching on Twitter. Somebody has a picture of uh, the ULA uh, Atlas, the ULA rocket, and then like uh, Falcon Heavy on the other pad. Like you can kind of see both of them, which was sort of cool and very reminiscent to me of the two shuttles on 39A and right. 39B. Mm -hmm. um, it was just, it was really cool to be able to see like both of those things kind of all vertical at the same time was, that was really neat. Um, but so I was trying to find it, but I, I can't find it. So I don't know. It's out there. Go find it yourself, I guess. Um, in any case, <laughs> uh, so you have homework, internet. <laughs> yeah, make yourself useful. Um, <laughs> we almost had one more launch, but it was scrubbed at the last minute last night uh, due to uh, ships and, and poor weather. And uh, uh, wayward boats. Hopefully, there might even be a launch today of the Electron rockets uh, for the still testing. Mm -hmm. So we'll see what happens when that launch window opens up later today. That'll be very very cool. Yeah, follow Rocket Lab on Twitter, and you'll get updates as to when they're when they're doing things. And birds. And birds, yeah. Lots and lots. I, it it and does birds. remain, I think, the most beautiful launch site in the world. It's just absolutely incredible. It's looking. not fair. It's not. Yeah, like it's just gorgeous. It's just incredible. <laughs> All right, so Benjamin. Uh, Area. End of an era is coming upon us. Yeah. Yep. Like, what's what's going on? The final ten Ariane five rockets ever have been ordered. So yeah. It's good, though. They're moving to the Ariane 6. So the final 10 Ariane 5s were ordered on January 9th. And this is just some uh, B-roll shots, just some uh, you know nice shots of Ariane 5 rolling out to the pad, which is an incredible workhorse rocket. Uh, there is a new over $1 billion euro uh, contract with Ariane Group to build these rockets. The final Ariane 5s will launch sometime between the year 2020 and 2022, which means that there will be overlap overlap between the Ariane 5 and the Ariane 6. Uh, Ariane 6 is expected to launch in 2020, uh, so you'll have a couple of years, depending upon any delays that you might see with uh, Ariane 6. Ariane 5 has launched 96 times since debuting in 1996. Dude. Uh, had, of those 96 times, there were 82 consecutive successes. Uh, if you wow. want to see some epic rocket explosions, uh, go back to the very first <laughs> Ariane 5 flights. Okay. They were, they, well, you know, it's a brand new rocket, right? So, right. Uh, you know, new rockets That's are hard. Bound to happen. Uh, so, yeah, and it did. Uh, you know. <laughs> uh, so, uh, there are 18 more missions slated for the Ariane 5, including the James Webb Space Telescope in 2019. If Jared was here right now, mm -hmm. he would be bouncing up and down in excitement. Mm -hmm. uh, we've also got the <laughs> Bepi Colombo Mercury Orbiter later this year. You've got more Galileo navigation satellites, and you're looking at right now, uh, so that's the Ariane 5 that's going to be launching these things. What you're looking at now is exploded views of the Ariane 6. Uh, this is kind of the, the artist rendering of what the Ariane 6 is going to look like uh, not, when it's not coming real out. Footage. <clears throat> Uh, so, uh, <laughs> Not yet. Ariane, so speaking of those Galileo satellites, are, so there are some final Galileo satellites on the Ariane 5, but then there are also two Ariane 6 flights have been sold to launch two uh, satellites each uh, for Ariane 6, so one Ariane 6 will bring up two Galileo satellites at a time, but it will not be the first flight of Ariane 6. The maiden flight of Ariane 6 will not bring a mass simulator up. It will bring a real payload, it sounds like. We just don't know what payload it will be. It will not be those Galileo satellites. That hasn't actually been announced yet. Uh, so, Do uh, they have a Tesla too? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. Um, so the the European Space Agency, Ariane Space, and everyone's looking for kind of a... Um, uh, they kind of subsidize the uh, the Ariane. Uh, I'm sorry. The, yeah, the Ariane five and Ariane six rockets. Mm -hmm. They're hoping to that there will be five institutional launches per year, meaning government launches or ESA launches, something like that. Sure. And then five commercial launches per year for a total of ten Ariane six launches every year to kind of help make it uh, break cool. even. Yeah. Just yeah. barely once a month. Just barely once a month. That's correct. Yeah. Oh. So you'll you'll start seeing uh, approximately not quite once a month an Ariane six launch starting. 
hopefully around 2020 or so. Uh, the first versions of Ariane 6, so the, the history of Ariane 6, originally it was like when it was just a clean sheet design, it was gonna be fully reusable, at least the first stage, like a fully reusable rocket. That very quickly turned into, okay, no, 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 no. It'll be partially reusable. Right now, when they launch Ariane 6, it will be completely expendable, meaning they will there will be no reuse on the Ariane 6 whatsoever. They hope to, in the future, in an upgraded revision, add partial reusability to Ariane 6. Reusability is so hot right now. Well, it's, so it just, it's funny how when you have to, A, specify that whether something's going to be reusable or refurbishable or not, like, completely expendable, and then you said that, and I actually grimaced a little bit, like, oh, that's gonna... <laughs> that's too bad. Like <laughs> that's half. right. Yeah. That's that's the reaction now. Of what what like, a, yeah. What a, exactly, Space Mike. No, what precisely. What a great time we live in, where you're like, oh, I can't believe that we're throwing that rocket away. Like we're just gonna. Uh, how that's how it? quickly things change. How quickly things change. Very quickly. Yeah. yeah. Very so, impressive. Yep. Uh, so well, final off. ten. No, final no, no. ten. Off world problems. Yeah. Off world uh -huh. problems. Exactly. Final ten <laughs> Arians have been ordered. Now th they do. Uh, there are eighteen launches left, so it's ten on top of the existing eight that. Uh, uh, that are coming, but that's it. That's the end of Ariane 5, sometime in the 2020s. Uh, well, yeah, timeline slide to the right. Yeah. Timeline slide to the right, but you know, around 2020, so end of Ariane 5, welcome Ariane 6. All right, all right, goodness. All right, so uh, Mr. Mike, this is something that actually came up uh, recently, Virgin Orbit and uh, you know where they are in their first flight and what's going on over there. So uh, what is yeah. going on over there? Well, um, they've been working on the Launcher 1 project for several years, and uh, um, it wasn't until just a couple of years ago that the, the group working on Launcher 1 was actually split from the rest of Virgin Galactic to be their own subgroup of Virgin Orbit. And uh, over the coming months, they've done quite a few different hot fire tests of their Newton 3 and Newton 4 engines, and uh, they've started off 2018 uh, with uh, quite a few different tests. Um, on January 9th, they did a test of their Newton 4, three engine for a pretty long duration uh, hot fire test for this. Uh, so uh, let's just check out the footage of this a little bit and then we'll talk about what this means. Now with this test, uh, they fired it for for over two minutes, and the, the Newton 3 engine is going to be powering the first stage of the Launcher 1 rocket. And the Newton engines are all turbo pump fed and use liquid oxygen and RP-1, or kerosene, as the oxidizer and fuel. And last year, Virgin Orbit, uh, as I said, also conducted multiple hot fire tests of the smaller Newton 4 engine, which will power the upper stage of the Launcher 1 rocket. And they were able to do several gimbal tests as well. Now, Launcher 1 is going to be air launched from the uh, uh, Cosmic Girl, a modified Boeing 747 airliner, Love and it's it. going to be launched uh, in a similar profile as the orbital ATK pe Pegasus rocket. Hmm. And with that, they, uh, the development on the engines has actually been a little bit interesting. They started off with these uh, uh, liquid fuel engines, uh, what they were calling the Newton 1 and Newton 2 rocket engines, but they discovered after several tests that they weren't going to be enough thrust for the type of vehicle that they were looking for. And something else that's kind of uh, good news for them is that Virgin Orbit recently signed a contract on January 16th with GOM Space, or GOM Space. I've, I've never heard of them before, so forgive me if I butchered that name. Uh, but uh, this company is going to be sending eight nanosatellites into orbit next year to track airplanes and maritime tracking, tracking ships. Hmm. And they're adding to a really growing list of customers Customers that are eager to start l launching on uh, the, this particular rocket, the Launcher 1. And if they maintain their schedule, the first test flight is going to be this summer. Sometime this year is what they're planning for, but they're shooting for this summer. And they could begin customer flights by later this year or early 2019. Now, Virgin Orbit also recently conducted a series of tests on their payload fairing as well. And in this video, you can see some of the separation tests that they've conducted to prove out the mechanisms and components to help separate uh, their full-scaled fairing. Uh, in these tests, they varied the operational settings to help test and tune the system, and they'll be doing a full separation system testing uh, later on in, in the year. So they've been making quite a bit of progress on this, and looking at the hardware 
that they have available, it actually seems pretty likely to me that they will be able to launch for the first time this year, by this summer. And how funny would that be if Launcher 1 starts launching before <laughs> Spaceship 2 does? To be fair, <laughs> humans are harder. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. Yes, for um, sure. But I also, sure. I also love the uh, super, like, new space... Uh, variation of fairing tests of like <laughs> get a crane get some fuzzy fuzzy cubes and just drop them on the cubes right it'll be fine <laughs> it'll be it's fine, fine. It's, it's like I don't know can we just go back to the picture go can back we rent to, a bounce right, house they just, they just dropped it yeah they just, yeah. They're just like eh so they, good. They, they did make them quite uh, intentionally the uh, two different colors though. oh yeah 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 we gotta know which side is which right <laughs> yeah very new space very right? new space I, yeah. yeah no I love it I think that was super awesome uh, but it totally made me laugh like of course, because they just have blocks of foam lying around. Goodness. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so uh, you teased this in the open. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm excited. So uh, if you're watching On Demand, you probably don't know. Like, the chat rooms have been kind of like, oh, your radio sucks, blah, 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 you know, bandwidth issues. Sure. Yeah. So who hates their internet service provider? Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, part of part of the problem, at least in the United States, for our international viewers, is that there's really no competition because uh, they own the lines, and so there's really like they set up these deals where no one else can come in. So everyone hates their internet service provider. Uh, it's very slow, very expensive here, not very good. Uh, even the studio, uh, we have a just a horrible connection to the internet well, here. Well, it's because it says business at the front. It says business in the front, so it must be good. Uh, <sighs> however, there are a series of companies working on low Earth orbit broadband internet satellites, and one of them recently made it to space. Telsat has deployed their first of their low Earth orbit broadband satellites. So this, this map that you're looking at right now is going to kind of give you an overview of what their entire constellation is going to look like. Understand their constellation's not up. They've got just one satellite in orbit right now. This launch aboard the portal Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle, uh, and once they have everything in place, it will be a global low Earth orbit constellation. They're hoping to get fiber optic speeds, what I'm going to call, uh, so fiber optic speeds can mean a lot of things. They call it fiber optic speeds. I'm going to say gigabit, because uh, uh, it could mean 10 gigabit, uh, and I'm, you know, possibly like 10 gigabit or terabit links between the satellites, but your connection to their satellite will likely not be more than a gigabit. But still, that's a lot. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, this will be for not, not just businesses like tomorrow where we need a really good internet connection, but also governments and, here's the key, individual users. That means you're going to have satellites in low Earth orbit, not not geostationary transfer orbit that are around a thousand kilometers, which means the ping times, the amount of time it takes for the signal to get from you up to the satellite and back to you, will actually be fairly reasonable, unlike traditional satellite uh, systems, where it's, you know, 100 plus milliseconds, uh, it's going to be down, it's going to be less than half of that, uh, potentially, typically around 30 to 50 milliseconds. So. That, that ping time, the amount of time it takes for your transaction to occur can actually be very, very important in your uh, internet connection. They're going to have both a polar and inclined orbit, meaning that they're going to be able to cover 100% of the globes, even the poles, uh, from basically everywhere at a bunch of different uh, angles as well. They're going to use optical inter-satellite links, which means they're not going to need ground stations everywhere. They're going to be able to communicate from satellite to satellite as necessary. Uh, and like I said in the beginning, right now they're just testing to make sure they get a solid, low latency, high bandwidth connection back down to the ground. They're a Canadian company, so they're basically testing in Canada right now. They're hoping to get 120 satellites lofted by 2021, and that's when they plan to go live with their constellation. So, it's neat, and I'm excited, but we are still a few years away from actual commercial services being able to do it. Although, if anyone, if anyone from Telesat is listening and you happen to have a connection in Southern California, I would love to test this for you because, holy cow, our internet connections suck. We're just a little bit south of Canada. Just a little bit just south. Like, just, just a, a wee bit. bit. We used to be closer when we were in Minnesota. We're a lot closer. <laughs> uh, the satellites themselves are hydrazine propul uh, propulsive systems, uh, so that, that allows them to raise or lower their orbit as necessary. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they also uh, own worldwide priority rights for the use of around 4 gigahertz of the Ka band spectrum. Now, Ka band is anywhere between 26.5 to 40 gigahertz. So they own, of that spectrum, they own 4 gigahertz of it. So they have a good chunk of bandwidth that they can work with worldwide to send broadband internet up, down, left, right, 
backwards, forwards, whatever. This this is exciting because this allows, at least in the United States, but is, if we're anywhere where you don't even have internet access, for anywhere you don't have competition, now you've got an option. Mm -hmm. This is just the first of these services coming online. You're gonna start seeing more and more and more of these services pop up. And this is one of those things that gets me excited about space because this is enabled by these low cost launchers. It's enabled by low cost satellites. It's the new space industry kind of doing really great things to help uh, better change your life, bring you broadband, awesome internet access to your home for hopefully a reasonable price. So I'm excited. I'm I'm really excited. Whether this one works or not, one I'm of them will work. So I, I have I have dubious. I, no no no. One of them will work, right? This is just testing, but something is going to work. This is like space at its greatest. I'm I'm really excited for this. All also, right. I want broadband. Like I want gigabit internet. I mean, yeah, yeah exactly. There's, there's that yeah, too. Who doesn't? Right? Yeah, exactly. Be cool, <laughs> and it, it, so this was launched on a PSLV. I think that last it was uh, this last week that the PSLV last launched. Last week, yeah. Uh, and they lofted like 31, 32, something like that, different payloads. Um, I'm doing a space mm -hmm. pod uh, on Thursday talking mm -hmm. about another payload that this uh, PSLV brought up, the Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle. So that's, cool. that'll be cool. Look for that on Thursday. Wow. Okay. Yeah. No, just anything else cool. you want to plug for yourself at all? No, but but uh, start <laughs> plugging some Kickstarter. <laughs> Just figured I'd ask while you were still talking. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take a little bit of a calendar break. So uh, Ben can run out to uh, Ten Forward out there, and uh, he's going to have a really great interview because Paul's always a really great interview with one Paul Hildebrand, first to the moon Kickstarter project, first to the moon movie uh, Kickstarter project. You See, got I got it this time. Stay with us. There's more tomorrow coming right up. And tomorrow continues. Now, before we get into our interview, I did want to give a shout out to all of the citizens of tomorrow who have helped to make this specific segment to this episode happen. These are Escape Velocity citizens. They've contributed $10 or more to this specific episode. We also have our Orbital citizens who have contributed $5 or more to this specific episode or $15 per month on makersupport.com. They get their name in the show for the second and third segment, access to our Patreon-only hangouts, and a bunch of other really great things. To find out those rewards that you get, head on over to patreon.com or makers support.com slash T-M-R-O. Paul Hildebrandt, welcome back to the show. Last time we had you on here, you were talking about your uh, Kickstarter documentary, Fight for Space, which I have on Blu-ray right there. There we go. Um, I will say, I've watched this documentary a couple times. It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, although, uh, I actually, we realized we don't have anything that can play optical media anymore. So the first time I ever opened this up, because uh, we got the downloaded version as well. First time I ever opened this up was uh, this morning, so I'd have the thing to show on the show. And you got this really great, like you made it into Mars. I don't know how well you can see that on camera, but this was really cool. So um, well done on Fight for Space. Uh, you've got a new project going on, though. So tell us a little bit about that. I do. So uh, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, I really like, really like your new intro, by the way. Uh, it's very, very Tron looking. <laughs> um, but... Uh, yeah, so we have a new movie. It's called First to the Moon. And uh, basically last year, my crew and I traveled to three locations to interview three astronauts, uh, Commander Frank Borman, uh, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders, the three astronauts that flew on the Apollo 8 mission. Um, and we're making a movie about Apollo 8 and the lives of those astronauts. Well, tell us a little bit about Apollo 8 for those who, I mean, we've got a heavy space uh, viewership, so I assume most people watching the show know ab about Apollo 8, but uh, just a really quick summary about Apollo 8, what its mission was, uh, and why it was important for um, getting humans on the moon. Sure. So Apollo 8 was uh, was the first, well, it was a lot of firsts. It was the first launch of the Saturn V, it was the full Saturn V with people on it. It was the, it was the first mission to the moon. A lot of people think the first mission to the moon was Apollo 11 because that's when we actually landed. But when you really think about it, the first mission to the moon was Apollo 8. 
that's when we we got there. We orbited the moon, and they took uh, you can see here they took this photograph, which is the famous Earthrise photo um, taken by Bill Anders. Um, and that was the first time that the Earth was really seen from that distance. That was the first time that people were able to view the Earth uh, from that perspective. And it really put things into a different light. You know, people had always seen the Earth. Um, you know, we had pictures from the Mercury program and pictures from the earlier Apollo missions where, you know, the Earth was kind of, you know, it was kind of like you could see part of it, but you couldn't see the whole globe. And then, of course, later in the other Apollo missions, we had the full blue marble photo on Apollo 17 and things like that. But eight is really important to me and, in, and I think is a really important mission just because of the number of firsts and, uh, and for that photo that really changed so much. Why not 11 or 13, right? There are other higher profile Apollo missions that I think everyone knows. Everyone knows Apollo 11. There's an entire movie about Apollo 13. So why, why other than the first, why choose eight? Mm -hmm. Well, when I was producing uh, Fight for Space, uh, which I started doing in 2012, uh, Neil Armstrong was on my list of people to interview, you know, making a space movie, why not? Short, well, shortly after, I think it was in 2012 or 2013, we, we lost Neil. And, uh, and then a couple of years ago, we lost Gene Cernan, the last man to walk on the moon. And uh, I started to realize that these guys are not going to be around forever. And, you know, luckily the crew of Apollo 8 is still with us. And I thought it very important to, to interview these guys and to document this mission um, while we still have the time. How was that for you when you got to sit down with each one of them and interview them? Was it... Was it a, a neat moment for you, or was it, have you already met so many astronauts that this was, you know, okay, cool, you've been on the moon, let's, let's do this? It's, it's, it's always a very exciting experience. It's always very, um, it's always very different. E each one is different. Jim Lovell, Jim Lovell, who I had met before, um, but he's really the only Apollo astronaut that I had, that I had met. Uh, we interviewed a couple of shuttle astronauts. Um, but when you meet the Apollo, the Apollo astronauts, it's a whole different, it's a whole different ball game. Um, Jim Lovell is, is very sort of down to earth. He's very into the exploration. He's very into the, the feeling of it. Frank Borman and Bill Anders, they are very much military men. They did it because they wanted to beat the Russians. Um, and, and they, they still believe that to this day. They believe that, that, uh, the United States is is the power of good in the world, and uh, and that they did their part to to beat the Russians by by getting us to the moon. Do any of them think we should be going back to the moon? Did they talk about any current plans, or was this all uh, Apollo eight past, like what we had done previous? Yeah, I mean, all of them are very supportive of spaceflight. Each of them are supportive in a different way, and and um, we're going to talk about that in the film. Sort of, we'll bring that up at, at the end. Uh, Jim Lovell is very supportive of, of both NASA and uh, commercial space flight. Um, the other two guys are more, uh, I would say, commercial oriented um, because they understand, uh, as Jim does, some of the issues that NASA has had in the past 50 years. Um, it's difficult for them to get things done, but that's that's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> well, and will you be doing, so you, this is a Kickstarter campaign. Um, you're, you're looking to fund it at this point. You've got, uh, you've got all the shots already done, right? So you've already done all the recording. So what's left? Why, why the Kickstarter campaign to, to move forward? Yeah, so all the filming is done. Uh, like I said, we went to the three locations. We interviewed the astronauts. And uh, we also got some B-roll of where they live. So Frank Borman lives in Montana. So we spent a day, we drove around, we got some footage of Montana. Uh, we also got footage of Chicago, where Jim Lovell lives. And then uh, Bill Anders actually owns an air museum. So he uh, allowed us to film his planes. He got in his P-51 and he's got a larger uh, Sky Raider and uh, flew those around for us. And uh, Did so we you got get some great fly? footage of that. Did he bring you I with him? I didn't get to fly. I oh, that would have been fly. cool. That must have been fun. Yeah, yeah, it was cool. I mean, you know, it's like, hey, can you go? You know, so they got in the Sky Raider and flew down, flew down the, the runway, and uh, it was, it was, it was great. 
So, uh, so yeah, yeah. What, what, yeah what, so what is it you need with a Kickstarter campaign? Yeah, so we're doing a Kickstarter campaign to raise funds for the post-production of the film. Um, that's basically the film footage, the musical score, the animation, uh, and other kind of boring stuff like legal fees and stuff like that that we need to just finish the movie. Um, but I can show you, you know, this is uh, this is part of a list of some of the films that we need to get. Um, and, you know, this goes on and on and on. But there are just tons of film reels about Apollo 8 that we need to have transferred. That's very expensive. The musical score to pay the composer and the live the live players to create a musical score is very expensive. And um, and then the animation, we have to hire an animator to create photorealistic animations uh, because I'm not that good. <laughs> <laughs> so we can properly illustrate the segments that were not captured on film. You don't want to do the uh, the YouTube thing where you're like drawing a whiteboard, have it like move, right. uh, stop yeah. motion. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, we were talking before the show about the film transfer because uh, you know I happen to know a few people who are able to do this. But uh, even something as simple as film, I say simple, but film transfer f itself is fairly complex. Uh, but something even as simple as that, um, you actually have huger challenges there because this is like historical archived film. Not anyone can touch this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's basically two companies uh, that can touch preservation material in Washington, D.C., the stuff that you get from the National Archives. Uh, a lot of this film has never been copied, so it's just like, you know, it's just sitting in the vault. Uh, if you imagine, you know, at the end of Indiana Jones when he walks into the room with all the boxes, that's kind of, you know, that, that's the National Archives. There's just all this stuff. Um, and uh, additionally, in, in combination with this, I've been uploading... All the footage that we transferred uh, from Fight for Space, I've got you know terabytes of data in those boxes behind me, right, <laughs> yep. right there. Uh, hard drives just full of terabytes of data um, uh, of of these Apollo, Mercury, Gemini era, even shuttle era, 16 millimeter and 35 millimeter film. So I'm uploading all that stuff in its raw format, ProRes 422, up to archive.org. Uh, so people can, other people can use it uh, to make films and further promote the exploration of space. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of places like you know, Ken Burns or whatever, he he'll he'll transfer umpteen number of films on the Vietnam War, and that stuff just sits on a shelf somewhere and nobody can use it. Uh, so I think it's better that you know we upload it. So share the. Uh, Share the material. Are you planning to do that with all the footage you're transferring for First to the Moon as well? Yeah, absolutely. All that stuff will go up on archive.org. And I'll probably create a website, you know, Space Archive something. Um, similar to what has been done with the Apollo Image Archive project, where all of the photos from the Apollo missions have been uploaded. Uh, we'll try to do the same thing with the with the video. So when someone contributes to your Kickstarter campaign on First to the Moon, not only are they helping you build this documentary, but you've got all of this film uh, that's being transferred and created digitally now uh, that maybe has only been seen once or twice before in its original film form uh, that you will, you know, by contributing to this Kickstarter, you're helping to also get all of that unseen media out to the public as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot, you know, a lot of stuff has been seen, you know, Discovery Channel did that uh, documentary series, uh, why, why We Left Earth or When We Left Earth, something like that, uh, years ago. And there's a lot of great footage in there, but it's just small pieces, you know, they'll cut in, you know, they'll give you a second, they'll give you another second to something else. But this way you can get, you can get the full reel and you can cut out what you want and you can see the whole thing as, was, as it was shot. You know, there's, there are hours of launch footage engineering, uh, what they call engineering camera angles, which are all the close-ups on the different rockets and the different stages. Um, tons of really great stuff. So, so yeah, help make the film and help spread the footage for everybody. Uh, so Loopy Dragon asks, once it gets digitized, then you, you, you publish it to archive.org, which to be fair, uh, that's gonna take some time, right? I mean, you've gotta make your documentary first. You gotta digitize this, you gotta make the documentary. You're trying to do this under a timeline, which we'll get to in a moment. Uh, it's not like it's all gonna be there immediately. You need time to actually upload it to archive.org. So this will be, a, a, I assume, a trickle release of media as you have time and resources to upload. Um, but the question is, once uh, Loopy Dragon says, once that film gets digitized, does it go into the public domain? 
it's already in the public domain. It's government film. It's already public domain. It, everything in the National Archives, with the, exception, with the exception of a few films, are public domain. Um, you just have to have the money to transfer the film. You're also trying to get your documentary, uh, First to the Moon, done uh, by the end of the year, by December. Uh, why is that? Right. So 2018, 1968, 50 years since Apollo 8. So we're trying to get it done and release it in December, which will be exactly 50 years from the Apollo 8 mission. Uh, since Apollo 8 launched on December 21st, 1968, um, we're hoping to have the film out before uh, the end of this year so we can get it done. And with our current schedule, a couple months to edit, a couple months to get the score done. In between that, we'll get all the footage transferred, get it done out. Getting it done by December is no problem. Uh, Cosmic Lettuce asked, you talked earlier about you know, some of the things you need to get done, some of the things you need to pay for to make something like this. One of the things was music. Uh, and Cosmic Ad, uh, Lettuce asks, who's your composer? We haven't locked down a composer yet, uh, looking at a few different things. Last time we, uh, we used Ron Jones, who did the music uh, for Star Trek, The Next Generation, mm -hmm. Family Guide, a bunch of other stuff. We may use Ron again. I talked to him last week about it. Uh, he's excited. Just depends on how much money we can get and uh, what happens. And speaking of money, uh, Tawicket is asking, what's the rough cost of getting all that footage digitized from film to whatever format you're using? It sounds like ProRes 422. Yeah, we yeah we get we get a we get a raw AVI, uh, uncompressed AVI, and a ProRes 422 copy. I've been uploading all the ProRes because the raw AVI is just insane file sizes. <laughs> um, <clears throat> The cost is, well, it differs because there's a lot of fees and stuff involved. But, you know, I, I, I've got a list of films that I wanted to transfer. I think I've got, you know, 12 films or something. It's like $10,000 just for those 12 films. And I'd like to get more. Um, they charge you per minute and then you have to make, and then you have to pay to make a copy for the National Archives because, so they can have a copy of it. And the, yeah, it's complicated. It's what, expensive, though. What was your uh, favorite moment in the process of all of this thus far? Either be it Fight for Space or for uh, First to the Moon. Like, is there, is there anything that stands out like, wow, that was that was incredible? Yeah, I mean, learning. Well, le learning how to be a better filmmaker was was the big part for me in doing Fight for Space. It took me a long time. A lot of challenges involved. Um, a lot of lessons were learned that uh, we're gonna be putting into the production of this film to get it out quicker and uh, get it done better. Uh, so we have a quick uh, clip, I think, that would be a lot of fun to show. It's the promotion for uh, First to the Moon uh, that you've got on uh, Kickstarter right now. So uh, let's take a quick peek at that video. American astronauts Borman, Lovell, and Anders are whirling about the moon on this Christmas Eve further away from home than man has ever been. At the time that we did it, I don't think we fully understood the significance of the very first flight to the moon. All right, you are go for TLI, all right? I understand, we're going for TLI. When you stop to think about the mission we were given. We choose to go to the moon. That was a remarkable challenge. I remember looking down through the grating and thinking, yeah, this is a big rocket. It's kind of eerie to go down to that big Saturn V on launch day. It's loaded with about five and a half million pounds of high explosive. Launch vehicle almost came alive. I only got scared twice in the flight, and the launch was one of them. One, zero. We have liftoff. Liftoff at 7.51 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. First flight on the Saturn V, first to leave the Earth, so there, you know, there really wasn't much to wring your hands about. I thought we had about one chance in three of having a successful mission. The greatest accomplishment was doing what the president had asked us to do within the time frame that he asked us to. What did it really mean, getting a, a true perspective where we were, three guys just 240,000 miles from the Earth? 
something caught my eye out of my window, and I said, hey, look at that, and it turned out to be the Earth coming up over the stark lunar horizon. And I thought, you know, how insignificant we all are. Everybody I ever knew, five billion people could be behind my thumb as I put it up. I think it's ironic that we went all the way to the moon to explore the moon. What we really discovered was the Earth. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. That does look all sorts of incredible. Um, even in our uh, chat room, uh, Smash Oars uh, uh, says, uh, all right, I'm in. He didn't quite word it that way. Didn't quite word it that way, but uh, yeah. Um, so uh, you're trying to raise $100,000 uh, while we were watching that. I did look it up really quick. Uh, you're, you're only a couple days in. The Kickstarter campaign just start, you're started. You're already uh, one-tenth of the way through. Uh, let's just say you don't reach the $100,000 mark. What happens then? If we don't reach the $100,000 on Kickstarter, uh, we don't get any of the money. Like Kickstarter, you have to raise your goal or you don't get any of it. So if we don't raise it, uh, we'll have to start all over again. We'll have to get, you'll have to scale down and uh, get less footage, get less music. Um, may not be able to have it out by December, and it'll just be a long, drawn out, complicated process. Uh, so we're we're just trying to get it get it in and get it done, um, so we can so we can have it out by the end of the year. Uh the, so let's say you get you get the, all the funds. Uh, you, you get mm -hmm. to December. You release the documentary, and then you go through all the stuff of like the rewards, mailing out the Blu-rays and whatnot. Uh, mm -hmm. You've done that. Uh, Neuropilot is wondering: after all of that, can you do a movie on Apollo Ten? Well, Apollo Ten was Gene Cernan uh, was was on that mission, and Gene is no longer with us. Um, so I think. Somebody else that's already interviewed Gene would probably have to do a movie on on, on Apollo 10. There, there's um, a lot of really. The, uh, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say this. This movie is told just by the astronauts. So, like Fight for Space, we interviewed like 50 people, and they all had their their thing to say. Uh, this movie, there's no there's no space commentators. There's no scientists coming in and saying on Apollo 10 they did this. No, this is these guys. They were on the mission. They flew there. They're telling their own story, and that's one of the ways that we're trying to make this a little bit unique. And if someone wants to help support this, they want to you know, help kickstart this, how can they do that? Uh, they can go to firstmoonmovie.com, click on Kickstarter uh, on, our, on our website, and uh, for $25, you can get a digital copy of the film, or if you want to spend a little bit more, you can spend 50 and we'll send you a Blu-ray. And uh, we're going to reproduce the Apollo 8 mission patch, the embroidered patch. We're going to have those reproduced as uh, close as we can to the original and be sending those out as well. That's, that's awesome. I've, I've already got uh, people in the chat room saying I've supported, you know, tomorrow supported it. We're, we're helping fund it. So, uh, and I hope as many citizens as can uh, will help support this. I think it's absolutely incredible. It looks like it's going to be a lot of fun. I, I know your first uh, fight for space was um, just absolutely incredible. I, I love and adore it. So I can only imagine what... Uh, um, uh, what First to the Moon is going to be like. I, I'm really excited for it. Cool. Thanks, Ben. Uh, before you go, uh, we have our standard mm -hmm. questions. Now, this is Orbit 11, so we've changed our standard questions. We ask this of uh, every guest, but you are the first <laughs> guest we've had on the show on Orbit 11, so uh, you get uh, you get the new questions. So uh, the first, okay. the, the, we may tweak these because I haven't actually asked anyone's opinion on the questions. I just kind of did them. Uh, the first question is, uh, which will fly first, NASA's Space Launch System SpaceX's Big Falcon rocket or Blue Origin's New Armstrong? Are you talking about the Falcon Heavy? Uh, nope, the Big Falcon rocket, the one, their, their moon, uh, I'm sorry, their Mars the, rocket. The, the, okay, the Mars rocket. Because um, Falcon Heavy launch is imminent, right? I mean, it may push to the, right. that, yeah, that, that's definitely, yes, yeah, already on the pad. Yeah, no, yeah. we're talking about, talking about the rockets that aren't even on the pad yet. I'm going to say space, SpaceX is whatever that thing's called, the Raptor or whatever. <laughs> yeah. that, that, All right. That, All right. It's going to launch first. Uh, human or robot exploration of the cosmos? Human. Where should we go next? The moon. 
Why space? Because it's there. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's the same answer you gave us the first time. Good, good on you for not wavering. <laughs> Paul Hildebrandt, thank you so much for taking time out of your Saturday to talk about your, uh, your new documentary. And not just your Saturday. I mean, these things are kind of life-consuming. So, um, you know, thank you for building these and helping to uh, get people excited about exploring the cosmos. Thanks a lot, Ben. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, comments from last week's show. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Science. It both draws us together and tears us apart. Brings discoveries to cure us and threaten us. It is neither good nor evil. It is what we decide to make of it. There is so much more to learn. And we are curious. Together, let's explore the science of tomorrow. And welcome back to tomorrow. Now, before we get uh, started with our comments, I did want to give a shout out to all of the patrons of tomorrow who have helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are people who have contributed ten dollars or more. They are Escape Velocity citizens. We also have oh, I said patrons. Uh -huh. uh, Escape Velocity citizens. Uh, we also have our orbital citizens, people who have contributed five dollars or more, and we have our suborbital citizens, people who have contributed two dollars fifty cents or more on Patreon and five dollars or more on makersupport.com. Get your name in the show in the third segment and access to that Patreon only hangout to find out how you can get your name in the show and all the different rewards and goals of tomorrow, head over to patreon.com or makersupport.com slash T-M-R-O. All right, Capcom, what did we have up uh, last week? Uh, last week, you made me do a little song and dance. <laughs> I did. It was, <laughs> maybe I should leave. It was, yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, it was the Mike and Carrie Ann show last week. Uh, we, we did a Getting to Know Space Mike, uh, Orbit 11.02. Getting to know you. Yeah, like, boy, poor thing, he's still blushing from that. Um, it was a really great episode. It was one of those where, like, yeah, just, I, I mean, liked Mike, it a lot. Mike is easy to interview. You ask him one thing, he's like Pomerantz. Like, <laughs> yeah, you ask him one thing, he's, right. off he goes, yep. Right, which is the only reason why I agreed to that. Because <laughs> I'm a terrible interviewer. <laughs> Mike, Mike made that look easy and good, so thank you, Mike, because that was, that was decidedly all you. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so given that uh, we had a lot of a lot of different kinds of questions, comments, concerns, and some complaints. Uh, that's actually why I said that in the open because that did kind of come across. Uh, the first one come here is from YouTube from ADD Dude. It says, uh, "But was that a problem with the funding milestone of flying Space Mike out for each episode? It seemed like a huge waste of money when you rolled out Hollow Mike. I thought, oh, you cheeky buggers, this is what you meant. I still think it would be a waste of money to fly him out there for each show. Seems that for the same money you could get him set up in California. Oh man, if that were true, we would do that." Maybe yeah. you don't know California. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I mean, I would love to do that. That would be amazing, but that is absolutely not in the same funding category. Uh, you need to understand, Space Mike, you don't live that far away from us. You're, you're only a hop, skip, and a jump. You're only one state away. So uh, the cost of flying space. But just far enough, that doesn't make sense to drive. Yeah, yeah, just far enough where driving's not viable, but short yeah. enough where it's only, what is it, like a 30, 45 minute flight? I mean, it's not that far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so mm -hmm. the costs are fairly minimal uh, to bring them in, but it, they do add up, right? You, you gotta fly them here and fly them back um, at, at four times per month. Mm -hmm. you, you know, that, that adds up fairly quickly. So we wanna make sure that we're financially stable on solid ground before we do something like that. Uh, if it was inexpensive enough to bring him out here, I would, I would love to bring him out here. And just, I mean, someday my hope is to do exactly that, to bring him out here and have him just there. work on the show full time, right? Just have him just, just crank out yeah. space pods. Oh yeah, yeah, wouldn't that be awesome? Um, you know, we oh are working. Gosh. Yeah, we are working on other things where um, I would like to send him to conferences. Like uh, we've got ISTC coming up in um, May. May. May, I believe. It, yeah, yep. yeah, it's here in Los Angeles. We've also got. Uh, uh, oh man, I'm, I'm going to get yelled at for forgetting the other one. Um, we've got new another space one. Space conference. That one's going to be awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's new space. Uh, that's not the one I was, th was thinking of. Uh, but the, we got a bunch of things, and where I'd love to send him out there and actually like interview some interesting people in the hallways 
and just you know turn those into segments, whether we air them on the live show or turn them into space pods, whatever it is. There are really cool and interesting people at these conferences, and we should just let the camera roll. And I don't even think we should edit. Just, just let it roll and just release it. Just. Yeah. Just space up Orbit Eleven. Space up Orbit Eleven. Oh, uh, is it? Is it? It's Richard Garriott, right? He is the citizen astronaut. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he had. Inc uh, was it ISDC? Um, Orlando many years ago. The, just telling a story about how astronauts poop in space. Yeah, I can't that remember. Needs which one that needs to be on the was. internet. No, I think that was Chicago. <laughs> sure. Telling this story in the hallway. That needs to be on the internet. So yeah. That was pretty amazing, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> all right. Um, all right, so uh, next comment also comes off of YouTube from one Eric Lurrell. IRL? IRL, yeah. sure. Eric in real life? It's hard to tell when the <laughs> I's, the capital I and lowercase L look the same. Uh, well, but yeah, IRL is probably much better. And anyway, it says, um, I'd like to know what modifications have been made to Spaceship 2 after the accident. It does have a nose probe, which are, the original version didn't have, and I assume that it has better locking system for the feathering system. I actually don't know. Uh, Space Mike, do you have any data on the, some of the changes? The, um, I don't know about the nose probe, but I do know that for the feathering system, they put in several um, kind of redundancies because, mm. I mean, it basically boils down to the, you know, I'm still kind of on the fence about whether it was truly pilot error or if it was just the, the vibrations were so much that the co-pilot accidentally flipped the lever or it might have even accidentally flipped by itself because the vibrations were so strong on that particular fatal flight. And so they've installed several redundancies. And from the way I understand it, both the pilot and the co-pilot have to, to be involved in the activation mechanism so that that feather flight, uh, that feathering system won't deploy accidentally ever again. And I've also heard that there are software updates too, so that even if they do pull all the different manual mechanisms for it, if it's not at the correct stage of flight, if it's not during the re-entry stage, it'll override that command and the feathering system will not deploy, especially when the, the rocket is firing. Beyond that, I don't know what other modifications that they've made to the vehicle. Awesome. I, yeah, I don't have any data uh, either, although Eric IRL is watching live and uh, mentioned that uh, IRL stands for Ireland, the country from which I hail. So if you're watching live from Ireland, w welcome Thank Ireland. Thank you, and I'm sorry, <laughs> I totally, like, you know, messed that one up. Huh. So, I, uh, Eric Laurel have, is kind of fun too. You know what we should do? Uh, <laughs> so, uh, as they get closer to, like, flights, um, let's, we should bring Virgin Galactic back on. And j just talk about you know some of the changes and, and you know some of the new things that are going on. But I, I right. feel like the timing needs to be more like you know they're in powered flights and they're kind of you know they're they're really pushing forward, kind of get people excited about some of those things. So probably later this year, early next year, that seems like sure. a, an appropriate time to maybe answer some of those questions. All right, next up. Next one comes up from <laughs> uh, from Reddit. And good luck with this one. I hate you. Uh, <laughs> oh, you know what? Uh, hang on. So while you're figuring that one out, yeah. Steve M. from the chat, chat room asks, what is ISTC? Google has nothing space science related. Uh, ISTC is uh, uh, <laughs> the International Space... The International Space Development Conference. No, well, no, no, that's no, what no. ISDC that's what I, so, is, which is what we were intending to speak about. Right. But sometimes the Ds and the Ts can sound very similar. ISTC uh, is... International Space Training Center, and it is a fictional thing at uh, Walt Disney World's Epcot uh, on their Mission Space Ride, which is a fantastic ride. If you haven't gone on it, I highly recommend it. Uh, but yeah, that's ISTC, not what I was talking about. ISDC, International Space Development Conference, uh, and it's, uh, yeah, here in Los Angeles. Yeah, and, well, this year, it, it moves yeah, around. It moves it's around. Uh, done by the National Space Society, mm -hmm. uh, which is really cool, and it's a, it's a very big, spacey conference, and that's, that's a lot of fun. But there are some really amazing conversations that actually just happen in the hallways instead of in some of the talks. Spe and and uh, so going backwards one more, also from the chat room, Green Jim uh, asks, has anyone asked Mike if he wants to fly back and forth for a show each Saturday? No, Mike does what I tell him to do. I don't, oh, why wow. Kidding me? I would love that, and I would love to go and move to California. My yeah. whole thing is just being able to support myself unless, you know, of course, they allow me to live in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a coat. I mean, you can. You just don't want. There's no shower, dude. Just don't, don't tell anybody. And then we'll... <laughs> All right, next up, next <laughs> up. <laughs> that's, that's what gyms are for. Right, right. Oh, man. Okay. Next one comes off of Reddit. Um, I'm going to guess at this one. Ipor Simov? 
That seems about right. Great. Uh, I love how Carrie Ann said, you're making the whole chat room very upset. <laughs> I did. Those are the, my exact words. Uh, and I appreciate how Ben Credible accepted it graciously. That wasn't gracious, but that was it about was. as gracious as he gets. Uh, uh, mistake, acceptance, learning, and correction. That's exactly how science works and how it should be presented. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, you know, I... Uh, I have famously said a whole bunch of things that are very, very wrong. And, oh, so uh, have I. So have we all. No, we all have. We all have. We and, all have at some point. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And and there's no there's no harm in, in just accepting that as an answer. And uh, the best part is though that we all got to learn together and at the same time. It's something um, I should have known. Like I like they were saying it, and I'm, and I'm rejecting it because I'm like that's not how it works. And then I'm thinking about it, I'm like. Okay, no, actually, that does make a lot of sense as to how that would work. You did so, make a lot of people upset. I, I did. I really upset the chat room. Uh, I am not in the camp of once you have an opinion, you must stick to it. If you've got a new set of data, a new set of parameters, you're allowed to change your mind, change your opinion, change, right? It, that's how that works. Right. Uh, and it feels like from a society standpoint, we've got into this, you know, no flip-flopping, no changing your mind. you got to be, you know, once you've decided this is the way it's got to go. Yeah. And that's, just, that's not how things work, right? Yeah. I, straight up, I, was, I, I didn't take all the factors into account um, or added too many factors, as my case may be. And, um, yeah, I was just straight up wrong. And, yeah, that's how that works. So I've got new data. I changed my opinion. That's how it should be. That's how it should be. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, absolutely. That's what we're here for, right? <laughs> Loopy. Wait, Ben was wrong again? Isn't the isn't the running joke that I'm always wrong? That rule number five isn't a thing? Rule number five isn't a thing. I don't know. You keep talking about that. I just have no idea. Magnets, how do they work? Magic. They work with magic. Unicorn magic. All right, moving on. Good. Uh, next one comes off of Twitter from Dan Rivet or Dan Sutton. Dan Sutton. Dan Sutton. Yep. yep. Great. Uh, this is a brilliant episode. Mike is an absolute credit to the show. To be honest, you all are. I'm a recent viewer and citizen of tomorrow. Thank you. After watching only for a few months, but so impressed with all you guys. Fantastic show and community. I'm learning tons, too. Yeah. Well, As are we, apparently. So that's great. Thank you for joining us. Uh, that's, you know, that's what we're here for. If it wasn't for uh, all of our citizens, uh, we, we would not. We would not be here. We would have these conversations anyway, mm -hmm. knowing us. Yeah. Because that's kind of the that's way That's how that the we show are. started. We were just talking about this stuff. We're like, let's put a camera there. Yeah, kind of, yeah. Oh, man, there is a Ben and Carrie Ann show that needs to needs to occur someday. Just like a GoPro in our car. Uh, the, it's, the conversations that happen there are insane. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. No comment. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the world will think so much less of me. <laughs> Not that they think highly of me now. It's just it will be so much less. <laughs> I can't. I just I can't. Anyway. Uh, can't next, even. I can't, can't even. Can't even right now. Can't even right uh, now. Next comment comes off of YouTube from one Royal James. Gotta like that name. Uh, Carrie Ann didn't ask Mike, quote unquote, the questions. They're a fascinating and important part of the interview segment, and you guys aren't exempt. We are not, but we did ask Mike the questions. We actually asked everyone the questions uh, in the final episode of Orbit 10, uh, which is why we opted not to ask him the questions because we hadn't rewritten them yet, and it would have just been redundant at that point. Uh, so let me know what you think of the new questions, if I need to tweak them at all. Why space is going to stay, that one is kind of a requirement. I think mm -hmm. that's an important one. The other ones are kind of up for grabs. I'm not so sure I like that uh, SLS, uh, uh, New Armstrong, uh, well, BFR question. If you aren't as clued into uh, Yeah, I don't know. Industry, that one, that's, that, that, one feels, that one feels a little weird. I think the other ones were kind of okay, uh, though. Kojin7 uh, in the chat room actually said, can we get Mike's answers to the new questions? Uh, you know, someday. Yeah, I think I think uh, probably the last show in December after, we'll after do the we same thing. Refine what they yeah, are. Yeah, let's get figure out what the questions actually are. But I, I think uh, I kind of liked the in the end of Orbit Ten. I liked in the beginning of Orbit Eleven. I liked having Orbit Ten end by looking backwards mm -hmm. and the Orbit Eleven begin by looking forward. Mm -hmm. And I, there was something I, I liked about us just sitting around the round table and asking the questions and going through that. I thought that was a lot of fun. Again, doing so, what we do, would do normally, even if cameras weren't here. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. basically that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I like All right. it. All right. uh, that's our show. I want to thank everyone so much for watching. And I'd also like to thank our ground support citizens. These are people who have contributed $1 on Patreon or $1 per month on makersupport.com slash TMRO. You get your name in the show during the third segment and uh, access to After Dark as soon as it is available. Thank you all so much for watching. We'll see you next week.